Um, my name's Sheridan Morris. I uh, live and work in Northern Australia, um, North Queensland, actually out of Cairns. I chair the new CRC for developing Northern Australia, which um, is one arm, it's a $75 million arm of the whole Northern Australia agenda, of which you heard a fair bit about this morning. Some of the I nearly choked on, but the rest of it was okay. Um, I also am the managing director of a post-CRC entity. That was the, the environmental or public good CRC, so CRC Reef, CRC Rainforest, and, uh, and a CRCP for Torres Strait. Uh, we call it the Triple RC, so there you go. When you bring that many CRCs together, you get swamped with acronyms. Okay, um, so we have options around innovation, and I make no pretense that I'm a keeper of any knowledge about how CRCs should be organised, governed, and do that. I do know that in keeping a post-CRC entity alive, not many have been that successful in doing it, and um, we're a decade on and $230 million worth of government grants and other grants, so we've survived that long. And also, I'm a weird pick to chair a CRC for developing Northern Australia, outside the fact I'm born and bred in the region, grew up in the Northern Territory, and have scant regard for authority, um, I have no other reason why I'd be picked. Uh, when I look here, uh, when Brian and Rowan said, uh, look, we want to really question how uh, research and innovation is actually servicing industry, and uh, I said, oh, thanks for that. That means I'm going to be sitting by myself at dinner because, you know, you've got to come out and insult all your peers to be able to do this. Now, I just saw everyone move around it, but I thought, I'll give it a go. Okay, Minister Littleproud said that R&D is the answer to agricultural growth. And so, one thing I do ask is, are the structures that we're very familiar with fit for purpose? Are institutions responsive? Have the models become immune to change? And if so, do we care? As you heard Brian say, they just dribble on, you know, like old fishermen, never die, they just smell that way. Well, um, are our institutions turning into that? Are our CRCs and our research entities turning into that? And have we learnt anything over the years? You know, a cooperative research centre exists for a particular reason, to bring innovation together with commercial sectors. Yep, researchers, everyone comes together should work perfectly. You know, they're not round the world. They are particular to this area, to Australia, but they are being copied by other entities. We find as the CRC system has matured or grown or just grown old over the years, uh, that policymakers like them, academics like them, and they think they're there because of their magnificentness. And um, I have to keep convincing my academic friends that, um, Getting the money doesn't have much to do with their magnificentness. It's pretty raw politic at the end of the day. But um, I will say industry can get really less than happy about some of the, the money spent and where the money goes. And I'll put, put some of those things on the line as we go through this talk. This is, um, I just wanted to show you my holiday pics. No, 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 no. This is wandering around Florence and um, actually stumbling into the Da Vinci and Galileo uh, um, museums. I couldn't help but see, for the first time, the underpinning of, all, of Western science, measurement. And when you see there and you're seeing there and you're looking at measurement for one of the first times, so instead of now it being an act of God, it, oh, I'm going to get struck down for some of the things I'm going to say, so you might want to move back. In, instead of it being an act of God that the church actually dictates, it was measurable, repeatable, all the elements of science that we have today. And it really does hit you really strongly. And you couldn't help but turn around and say, so why was it so? Why did we see the Renaissance deliver such innovation that we're not seeing out of our term and generation now? Because every society is clever. They're clever people. I work a lot in PNG and those areas. There's clever people anywhere. But what do you need? You need funding. And they had the Medici families, but you, you need funding. 
you need encouraging systems. So in that case, the church backed off a bit and took some of the rules away and let some things happen. Where you work in high rule-based societies, like indigenous societies, really, really strong rule-based, innovation's actually really quite constrained. And most people don't see, you know, indigenous communities like that, but that's exactly what they are. They need supportive institutions. And really, I'm proxying this for the CRCs and others, so, but you can get that. You're smart people. And um, they had little hidden societies for engineers and scientists to do funny handshakes and run around. So they had their supportive institutions. And there was also a big expectation amongst their peers that they would deliver. So you sit down and you see these amazing steps forward do have some basis in how we want to structure a CRC. Traditionally, we unleash our science on the world, but it's pretty undeveloped and it's often not particularly usable. And as we develop and, and push our agenda forward, we need to be usable. We need to be of value. And our value propositions, we articulate them well academically, but in, we don't implement them well. We don't bring it to actual a conclusion where people, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, can benefit out of them. And I will argue that medium-sized businesses, big business, businesses innovate, but medium-sized businesses actually take the biggest amount of risks. And often that's taken up by the bigger business at that time. And we don't, we don't really deliver into them particularly well. Um, as I said, the concept around innovation often sets with academic institutions where we know that, that they're not the holder of all knowledge and we know we need to spread out the capacity for innovation across broader agendas. And everyone's heard this a million times that we don't translate well and we don't implement well. And so that's bringing multidisciplines together in a very, very different way of doing business. Now, heavens to bid, if we bring ecologists and engineers together, I think there would be an explosion or a thunderstorm or something. But um, that needs to happen more and more in the structures of, the, of, of our institutions that we have. We fail repeatedly, and this isn't my term, <laughs> this is... Uh, another term, but we call it familiar fail. So we go out and we keep on repeating the same things that don't deliver us an outcome. And sometimes you've got to look at this. The world's changing. You heard about all of that today. Can we change with it? So all I can do, give on, I'm not a keeper of all knowledge, but I can tell you our story. Um, in the North, we can't run the competitive processes as easily and as well as what you do in the South here because we have limited resources and limited capacity. As a matter of fact, I would argue that as we are overtly competitive, we actually shrink the pie rather than grow it. And that's particularly, well, I see this often in the marine science community and other areas where I call it eating each other's babies. We're in a small area and we all fight over the crumbs from the table rather than growing the pie and building a bigger uh, financed agenda. Okay, now my boring, you know, governance and structural form are terribly, terribly boring and I apologise to you in advance for this, but um, we've got to do things differently. Often now, with the universities in particular, under so much pressure, CRCs and others are just seen as funding <coughs> organisations. They're not seen for their real intent and they're ju it's just a cost shifting exercise. And, lot has, and there's things we can do to make it not that way. And I'm not being overtly critical of the um, university sector, but I say it's, it's a real issue. As I said, limited interdisciplinary research and collaboration, and we're a special case in the North. So what we did, we looked at the CRC reef, and I would argue that we had poor delivery. We had about 30% slippage. That means no delivery of research outcomes, or they were late, or the quality was very mediocre, and pretty poor value for money at the end of the day. Now, I'm going to get hated by a few people for saying that, but that's OK. We had things called reach-through contracts. We had suitcase scientists flying in, doing the job, and then buggering off, being pretty ineffective for what they were doing. And we had researchers controlling the agenda. And at the end of the day, the major industries associated with it, which was the marine tourist industry and others, were really disappointed in the products that were coming out. There was some good work done, don't get me wrong, but overall, they were a bit disappointed. So what do we do? How did we actually change it to getting 3% slippage rather than 30? Uh, in the north, we need supportive networks. You have to make friends and you have to collaborate. 
um, you need to build a platform, and that's a platform with the community that we didn't have before. And you need to also convince the government agencies that they need to love you in a different form. And um, most of the time they don't want to love you too much, but oh, some of the politicians clearly do. But um, I'll move on from that. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, it just came to head. Um, <laughs> I'll move on. <coughs> uh, so, so both in the uh, RRRC and the CRC um, for developing Northern Australia, we don't actually ask the research institutions to put in money. They do it on a project by project basis, so there's no generalised investment in the CRC, so there's no expectation of a big handout on the other side. We don't have reach through contracts. That's where you have the principal investigator get all the money and then they hand it out to everybody else because that's where most of the research falls down. It's not because the research is poor or the hypothesis is poor. It's mostly because they, um, somebody doesn't pay somebody or somebody doesn't give the bit of research to their partners. So if there are four partners, there are four contracts. So each actually contracts back to us. Now this is really boring stuff, but it changes how the dollars work. If we say uh, contract CSIRO for and maybe in five different projects, it will be one contract with a whole lot of schedules behind. If somebody out of one of those bits of contract fails to deliver, CSIRO doesn't get paid at all. Now, usually if it's a $50,000 contract, no one wants to talk to you. But if it's a $2.3 million milestone payment, you suddenly get some interest and they want to play. So you've got to change your levers in this game if you're actually going to get some outcomes. You also have to have regular end user review because projects wander off the main game and that's how they get really upset. Now, being a value to the north, of course there's the crop production and adaption R&D that you'd expect to be done. But mostly what we need to figure out is how we overcome the, the barriers. And I recently interacted with the uh, Singapore um, ambassador who told me some really home truths about uh, investment in Northern Australia, which made me choke a little when I heard this morning, because he was saying, Singapore's a premier invest investor. And he said, unless you want second tier investors, you have to do a number of things. Harmonise your regulation across jurisdictions. The fights between the Commonwealth and the states and the interstate fighting just really pulls away from investment. Sort out native title so it's not frightening. Native title doesn't need to be frightening, by the way, if it's worked and approached better. Your environmental regulations are all over the place. People come in to invest and then find they've got barriers to crawl over. We need good environmental regulations, but uh, EPBC strategic assessments on key site areas would overcome that. Energy costs are ridiculous and we need to start addressing that in a really big way, particularly up in the north where we're, we're off the grid a lot of times where there's better ways of doing business. Wages cost, you've heard about it, poor connectivity, I'm sounding like I'm beating the north drum but that's exactly real, and poor communications. The internet of things, digital disruption, all these things are going to drive the development of, uh, and sensors are going to drive the northern agricultural agenda. But you're not going to get those unless you've got good comms, unless you've got access to internet, unless you've got these things. This basic infrastructure isn't there and needs to get there. Okay. Last but not least, you've got to work with investors, industry and community from the start. These are all basic. We all know this stuff. Bring players in who understand the industry in the geography that you're working with. When I fly researchers up from ANU and take them into the Torres Strait or somewhere else, usually it's two weeks before I have to medevac them out with ulcers all over their legs and things along those lines. So you need people who can actually work and operate in these really quite extreme environments. And um, it's, you've got to build trust. Everyone talks about trust, but trust is the name of the game, and make friends with the community, and also let the minister know. So when the minister gets out of the plane and he sees all the people there and he says, you know, I'm wonderful, I've just given you another $28 million and expects all the accolades. Uh, often he gets yelled down if the research hasn't happened properly, if the representation hasn't happened properly, and he goes away mumbling to himself that he's never going to give you another $28 million. So make sure you set the frames up for your ministers well. You shouldn't just get an hour, uh, 10 minutes with the minister, you should get a good hour. And you get a good hour by making it 
him, see, him or her see they've got something in the game. So it is a political agenda. We need to change what we're doing. We need to harden it up and we need to start being of value. So thank you.